So I got an interesting email a couple of days ago. Okay, what's that? Uh, from the, the company that I work for. Uh, it was an email saying that I got chosen for a random drug test. You never had one of those before? I had the initial one to get enrolled in the program, but I have not yet been called for a random up until that point. And it was dated two days before I read it, which meant that if I didn't go that day, I was facing a $7,500 fine for noncompliance. They can't find you as an employee. <laughs> it, it may go to the company, but regardless, the $7,500 fine was on the line. And when I looked at the, the form that they send you to take into the testing site or collection site, the address was in Plainsboro, Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> I so. live in Michigan. <laughs> so how long of a drive was that? Uh, it was not. I, I called the uh, the lady in charge of the consortium and said, uh, "Is it? It said in there, it chooses thirty miles from the business address for the closest collection site. If you're not, call this number." So I got reassigned to go to Chesterfield, and if I didn't go that day, then the fine was on the line. Did you pass your whiz quiz with fly, flying colors? I'll know in twenty four to forty eight hours, but knowing that I do nothing besides drink, I will pass with flying colors. All right. <laughs> It's time to hit the trail, lock in those hubs, and throw it into low range. Because you are listening to Wheel It with Keith and Johnny Orange. Broadcasting from the Thin Line Off-Road Studio, they're here to talk about 4x4s, trucks, and everything to do with enjoying the great outdoors. Buckle up, here's your hosts, Keith and Johnny Orange. Dude, that was the weirdest intro ever. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's the only update that I have, I'm sorry. There's no updates on Project X, Jay? Nah, it's pretty much about where it was. I had the week off, and then it took me the following week to kind of catch up with everything else I was behind on. <sighs> so, unfortunately, nothing yet. Man, John, I <laughs> I don't know. I, I've got a are you, You're going to make the, a month. You have a <laughs> month to weld in floors, yeah. get it running. Finish the front suspension, put the front end back together, mount the rear bumper, finish building the front bumper. Paint it, do upholstery, shots. repair all the rust. No, I'm, only, I'm focusing on the driver's seat. I can do the other seats later. Oh, <laughs> all right. I, I just, nothing on Project XJ. Well, nah. I, I guess... I guess I'm not one to talk. I mean, my <laughs> Land Cruiser is still out there with a blown up rear axle, and uh, <laughs> that that happened back in well, what was that February, March. Producer Andrew's nodding his head in agreement. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we've just both been really busy with all the podcasting stuff yeah. and our own, you know, day jobs and yeah, everything like that. And then, of course, owning the the off road company with me, it's just like. You know, so you have a better excuse than I do. At least. Well, I mean, no, I don't. It's like the plumber <laughs> with leaky pipes, man. I just, you know, I, I just don't work on my own stuff. I work on other people's, and yeah, but um, yeah, you know, uh, on our last episode there, we were talking about the um, uh, you know, the manual transmission being dead now, mm. and uh, unfortunately, or you know, dying a very quick death. Um, and then, you know, we were doing a little research there after the show. Um, you know, the question became, okay, well, what about like the medium duty trucks that uh, you know the sh- new Chevy Kodiak, which they're calling the Silverado cabin chassis hmm. truck? They're not even called the Kodiak. We discovered uh, no manual there, and no manual in the Ford six hundred and fifty or seven hundred and fifty. Yeah. And then uh, I'm going to read this sentence again to you to see how what you think of this oh, sentence. Don't, what? Oh, come on, man! This is <laughs> go this, ahead. I, I, it's, oh, where? Let me see if I can find it here. Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, this is right from Ford's website. The Ford Torque Shift HD oh. six-speed automatic is specially designed. Oh no, 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 I'm reading the wrong one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is the wrong one. I I am not reading the, it. You said some keywords though. That just yeah, yeah, crazy. yeah. I know. I know. Um, I read something else on the site that was a little while ago that was a little, I know, troublesome to you. Almost brought me to tears. Yeah, that was, uh, um, you know, just looking at, oh, here we go. This is what it is. Ford medium-duty trucks are designed to deliver power and performance for almost any job. There's the Ford-built Power Stroke Turbo Diesel V8, teamed with the only transmission you'll ever need, the Ford Torque Shift 6-Speed Automatic. (laughs) 
<laughs> ah, See, no. oh, John, it's the only transmission you'll ever need. Nah. You don't need any other transmission but the six-speed automatic. I need anything but. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, you, I'm just gonna just keep jibbing. You're gonna keep you. taunting just, me. With I, that, I, you? I, I, you know, I'm a manual guy too. I'm gonna wake but, up in the middle of the night or early morning with just a picture of a torque converter or something from you, aren't I? Oh, there you go. Yeah, just. Uh, oh, why did I say that? Yeah, torque. <laughs> I didn't even know you had torque converter in your lexicon. I can speak the language. Oh, I don't okay. like the language, but I can speak you it. You ever see that meme online that shows the difference between automatic and manual? I don't know. It shows the diagram of the transmission, you know, with a, with a manual. You know, the people always switch them around, but I always love seeing what they say. Like the manual one, it's like crisp, clear shifts, and yeah. then power, and then the automatic is like disappointment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. But I mean, in reality, there's lots of great automatics. But no, you know, it's no, <laughs> it's it's just user preference. I mean, I no, I'm still there's manuals and then there's wrong. Well, you know, <laughs> I think with me and my my you know advancing age here that um, I'm okay with an automatic for my daily driver slash tow rig, but I still want on the trail. I want my manual. Yeah, um, and uh, that's the uh, you know that's the problem there, but. I guess enough with the transmission talk. We've been Thank doing <laughs> we have been doing this for like three episodes. Um, you know what I wanted to talk to a di- today a little bit. Um, well, you know, actually, Project XJ, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's talk about Project XJ for a second. Okay. Uh, you put a uh, lift kit in Project XJ, right? I did. And, and so it's not it's not exactly a kit. It's more a, a culmination of a lot of different stuff. It's like a homebrew setup. What Pretty about much. what about your other one? I think you call it Pegasus, your uh, yes. X, your TJ. Yep, it's got a, a four inch lift. It uh, also it's got a, a couple different brands of parts in it to compose of the lift. Okay. But yeah, it's it's got a four inch lift. Uh, just using the stock short arm type setup, aftermarket arms, of course. Uh, to correct the suspension angles or the uh-huh. geometry angles, but yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I mean, it works. <laughs> and so your suspension or your your lift, mm-hmm. it lifts what? Suspension. Well, then it would be a hover car. <laughs> well, I don't know if it were hovering with no attachment to the ground. It, in- it- all right. You want to get technical? It increases the clearance and travel. Between the lower axle spring mount and the spring mounts on the vehicle. Oh, okay. So, the, yeah, and that's why I'm asking here because obviously I know what it is. But, um, you know, it's a term that's thrown around in the off-road community all the time. is a lift kit. True. And then, you know, to con- further confuse the matter, people say it's a suspension lift kit. Mm-hmm. Well, your suspension of the vehicle is at the very bottom of the vehicle. Yes. And your lift kit doesn't raise the suspension uh in fact True. it does the contrary um it keeps the suspension where it is but it lifts the frame and the body of the vehicle yeah yeah um but it's not a body lift oh god body lift is different oh, so we'll talk about that that's in a minute. almost but, as bad as an automatic but if <laughs> technically if you're lifting the suspension you're lowering the body of the vehicle so off-roaders just call things by the wrong names man i guess yeah we do it's terrible we're I, a weird I, bunch we are very weird very <laughs> weird um, so, uh, you know, if you hear, if you're a newbie, um, you know, you're probably not if you've, if you're listening to this show, but if you're a newbie out there, um, a lift kit, like I just said, it lifts in some form or another, essentially the body of the vehicle. Yeah. And, you know, body John, or body frame. Yeah. So why John would somebody want to lift the body or the body and frame of their vehicle um more clearance for the body itself you can get bigger tires on there um biggest thing it increases your travel suspension and articulation so well you can, you that's can, ar- that's arguable though because i mean you with your suspension i mean depends on the lift kit true true if you just throw some pucks in there your suspension stays the same as that it was that that would be more of a uh, cosmetic type, like a body lift, so you can stuff bigger tires under there. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, since there's so much confusion out there, and uh, why don't we talk about that today? Why don't we talk I'm about, for- like, you know, different different look at So, um, to start up, to go back to what you're talking about, with Project XJ, you said you did kind of a combination mm-hmm. of a few things. Um, and you lifted that about how many inches? About four and a half, 
four and a half to five before the suspension settles out. Okay. So, yeah, it, uh, the rear we did an Adelief type setup. Actually, we did what they call a bastard pack. So we took the, a set of this springs. It's a family show, John. Oh, that, that's the term. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> we, we took a, a set of leaf <laughs> springs that were pretty worn out from another vehicle, cut the eyes off, bolted it to the main leaf of that, and the increased arch and uh, spring rate from those springs gave it that extra lift. So that gave us about a five-inch lift, I think it was in the rear, is what it totaled out to. Fair enough, fair enough. So. Um, and like you said, the, the benefit of uh, lifting the structure of the vehicle mm-hmm. is mainly um, tire clearance. Typically, yeah. And, and you know, better ground clearance, p- breakover point. Mm-hmm. Breakover point is the point at the middle of the vehicle where like let's say you're going over a rock or a log um the higher you lift the center of the vehicle the less chance it's going to get hung up on something Mm off-road so you know with a lift kit you know you get you taking off on me no just shifting seats oh okay um with a lift kit you're going to get many many different options many 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 different brands oh yeah um but there's still only a few ways to do this. So earlier you mentioned a body lift. Um, mm-hmm. I know what it is. Why don't you explain to our listeners what a body lift is? So a body lift, <laughs> again, is one of those more or less cosmetic type lifts. Uh, what it does is it takes the body mount locations on your frame and it adds height to them. You put a typically a spacer block or a larger bushing in there to lift the body off the frame. Uh, one of the main, and as far as I'm concerned, only advantages of that is you can get bigger tires in there. Yeah, um, I guess a minor advantage uh, is also that it does, in most vehicles, give you a little bit more mechanical clearance for, say, removing the transmission, uh, removing yeah. the transfer case. Um, I would give it that, I guess, yeah. Yeah, and those are really the only ones that I know of. And yeah. the cons of a body lift are oh, that... Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, um, it, most vehicles were not meant to be set up on pucks like that, mm-hmm. especially if you get in that three-inch range. One Ooh. inch, maybe two inch, they're okay. But you start going three inch or higher on a body yeah. lift, you're going to really tweak your body mounts and the frame mounts for those. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, so that there's a, we've talked about the disadvantages of those in the past on the show, I believe. Yeah. And uh, Not to mention, too, and when you start getting significant height, you have to start worrying about things like your radiator to make sure that you're going to get enough airflow to keep it cool. Steering shaft clearance. Yeah, engine mounts, because everything's got to connect and hook up still. Engine mounts typically don't move the engine with a body lift, but um, some all of the higher ones they make them. Oh, okay. I've seen them to to raise that back up, which is going to kind of restore oh. a lot of the the short wire, short you know piping issues that you're going to have with gotcha. that. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, that's uh, so body lifts. The 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 advantage is really the. Cosmetic. Uh, co- cosmetic, <laughs> larger tires, I don't think they look that great. But, I am not a fan at all. Um, the other advantage would be that they're incredibly cheap. I mean, you can buy yeah. a body lift kit for under $200 for just about any body on oh, frame yeah. vehicle. It's, it's one option. I, I'll admit I've looked at like a one-inch lift maybe for my Wrangler, but the only reason being I need to, you know, my body bushings are shot. A lot of the mounts are not very healthy. And a lot of that is just attributed to dirt and stuff being packed in those tight spaces between the gap. Yeah, so true I've enough. looked at the option of a one inch just to gain that extra clearance, you know, help it dry and keep it a little more clean. And that so. seems to be the acceptable amount in the off roading yeah. community today. One to one and a half inches of body lift mm-hmm. is acceptable. Anything over that. Pretty much at that point, you need to start looking at suspension yeah. components. Not, not to mention, even if you're going that high for cosmetic to fit bigger tires, now you have to account for the fact you're going to have a three-inch gap between your body and frame. And if you don't get one of those inserts to hide that, it's just going to look goofy. Even with the inserts, you can still tell. Oh, yeah, you know, absolutely. At least get people with a sharp eye like you and I that yeah. they're familiar with trucks and 4x4s. Yeah. And, 
something just doesn't look right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's really the cheapest version. Uh, the second cheapest version of a lift, which is not really even a kit, but that would be doing a spring over mm-hmm. on a leaf spring vehicle. Yeah. Um, many older leaf spring vehicles, um, and that, uh, you know, leaf spring, of course, is a, a long device. Uh, it's not like a coil spring. It's just a long, you know, bars of steel that flex. And um, many leaf spring four-wheel drive vehicles, the leafs are mounted underneath the axle by unbolting the axle assembly and putting it underneath the leaf springs, you gain four to five inches of lift. Oh, yeah. And it can be done. <coughs> I mean, it re- would require a little bit of welding, but even, I mean, basic MIG welder will do that. Yeah. And it's very simple to do. And there are, depending on the vehicle, there's even some bolt-on kits like the Suzuki Absolutely. Samurai. Yep. Uh, Rocky Road's got a bolt-on kit that you can just bolt it on and it's fully yeah. reversible if you want to take it back out in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the the early 4x4s were pretty much all leaf spring over a solid axle. Mm-hmm. So uh, doing a spring over was pretty popular for a very long time. Yeah. And then, of course, in the 80s, they started the monster truck fad with the big, uh, you know, your Bigfoots and all the other ones. And... People wanted to get even bigger and go to like 40 or 44 inch tires. And at that point, custom springs became the only option to do yeah. that. And uh, you would send out your springs and have them rearched, or you would, you know, do whatever you put blocks in. Yeah, um, yeah That's well. That's another one of those, not, not a fan. <laughs> yeah. And uh, speaking of blocks, um, in no state is blocks of, uh, in the front. Uh, legal. No. You can have blocks in the rear. But um, it's only up to like three or four <laughs> inches or something, isn't it? Or maybe even two. I, th- I think that might be a state-by-state basis. Ah, gotcha. But, <clears throat> pardon me, frog in my throat there. Well, quit eating frogs. Um, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> um, or cook them better. State-by-state basis, but with the, um, the rears... If you're going to stack blocks, which is never yeah, a good idea, no. although there are some factory vehicles that come with stack blocks, which is really weird, huh. um, it, they should be welded together or yeah. secured I'll together. Say, I've somehow. seen factory blocks on them, but never stacked ones. I've only seen the stacked on one. Um, it was, a, I think it was a Ford, if I remember right, and hmm. it came right from the factory. It was a factory snowplow package, taller vehicle, an older vehicle. But, yeah. Um, so... Yeah, so that, you know the, they would do the lift blocks between the spring and the axle, which pushed them up even higher. Um, those were all cheap options here, uh, and, th- and this is what we're doing this episode. We're talking kind of about the terminology and, oh, yeah. and explaining what things are. Um, by the time coil springs came out, and I've not done a lot with building coil spring off road vehicles, just a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the first thing, and, and I know you've done it, the puck lifts, right? So I haven't done that exclusively. Okay. But I've used lifted springs. So they're, there's two different kinds. Really, you're going to have one that's got more coils or a stiffer spring rate or combination of. Yeah. And that's going to get you that extra travel over the stock springs. Pros and cons to that are going to be uh, the stiffer springs obviously going to ride stiffer. Oh, yeah. But if you're putting heavy things like a winch on there, yeah, not a bad idea. <clears throat> Um, the softer springs with more coils, um, are going to be more of a factory type of ride or even maybe softer than factory. Potentially. Yeah. And that's where your shocks are going to make up a little bit of that difference. Yeah. Well, now that you mentioned shocks, um, if you are lifting via a, some sort of suspension lift kit, Mm. um, you need to make sure that the kit either comes with shocks or yeah. shock mount relocation tabs. Absolutely. Or that there isn't an interference issue. That's one thing that's very often overlooked in a lot of kits. People, they'll put bigger springs or these lift pucks. Then you're bottoming your shocks out. You're going to blow your shocks. Yeah, oh, and it also limits your your articulation too, and your travel. You're using essentially your shock as a limiting strap, and that's, mm-hmm. that's just damaging to the shocks. <laughs> it is. It is. So, you know, that's... Uh, you know, you want to take a look at, and when you use the word kit, that kind of implies that it's a package deal. 
that it comes with everything you need. And um, so, you know, uh, you, there's a lot of different options out there mm-hmm. as to, you know, what you can get into that kit. It can be as simple as blocks. It can be as a complex as a kit that comes with 75 pieces. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the sky's the limit with that, and it's, it's totally dependent on your vehicle. You know, I, I've seen some uh, independent suspension vehicles that come with a whole steering knuckle. Yeah. You know, whereas, you know, my buddy lifted his Colorado, it came with new torsion keys and drop differential spacers for the front. That was it. Exactly. So simple well, versus What complex. say you uh, that we take and uh, go over a couple of those options after break? Sounds good. Hey, it sounds like it's time to swap out that old engine for something better, John. Yeah, man, but I have so much into my trans and transfer case set up already. I don't want to change those two. Sounds like you need to call Quick Draw Brand Adapters. They specialize in conversion bell housings for nearly all diesel and gasoline engines, including the new 2.8R Cummins. You know, I like weird engines, though. I want something different. Then you definitely need to visit quickdrawbrand.com today. They have those hard to find parts. They also have used diesel engines available. You can call them at 513-446-9654. Cool, I'll do that. See what they have. Thanks. Welcome back to Wheeling. I'm Johnny Orange, and Keith and I are discussing lift kits today. Yeah, we are, John. Um, And there's a lot of different options out there. Uh, And I think, you know, I was just thinking of this during break, that what we need to do is we need to kind of separate out the differences. Now, we already covered what your options were for leaf springs, and that's mm-hmm. pretty much taller rearch leaf springs uh, and some shocks, and that's pretty much going to be your entire kit. Maybe some and relocate blocks, blocks relocation yeah. for your brake lines. Um, where it gets more complicated is when you get into a vehicle that has coil springs um, at all four corners or yeah. just the front. Um, I don't think there's any that have leafs in the front and coils in the rear. That'd be weird, but... That would be. Awesome. I've seen it on the trail in a home brew rig, but... I, I, I kind of want to do that now just because, but... <laughs> well, I had, a, I had a buddy who used to wheel a full-size Chevy, and he put Ford radius arms with coil springs in the back, so he had nothing hanging out the back. So mm. his departure angle was like 90 degrees. It was perfect. Yeah, it was nice. awesome. Um, but anyways, uh, you know, so if you've got a vehicle that has coil springs somewhere, whether it be in the front or the rear or all four corners... Um, the difference, like John was saying earlier, is stretched leaf springs that have additional coils um, or putting pucks on top of them that space out the difference between the coil spring and where it mounts on the frame of the vehicle. Mm. So, um, and then, John, you actually have more experience in this than I do because I've been almost exclusively a leaf spring guy mm-hmm. and then the few coil spring uh, 4x4s that I've had I've pretty much stuck stuck to stock components. Gotcha. Um, or you know, I've helped a few buddies build some pretty crazy stuff too. Mm-hmm. But um, I know you went with a long arm kit, was it? So I've got two different types of uh, between my two jeeps, my two wheelable jeeps. I've got two different setups with that. Yeah. Um, the Project XJ has what's it, it's not really a long arm, but it's a long arm style lift. Uh, I'd, I'd call them mid arms. So it actually, there's a whole subframe kit that actually bolts to the unibody f- or uniframe on the front mm-hmm. that drops the mount location and gets me back to a stock size or stock um, angle control arms for that. So this would be um, essentially putting longer control arms. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It, it's gonna it's gonna move the locations once you lift it. It's kind of weird to explain it, but when you lift a coil or you put more coils in, you're actually extending your lower control arms and your upper arms. What that's going to do is cause your axle to roll. So to correct your caster is going to be off. Yes. Then. Yeah. Yep. And your your at ride height, it's going to be more angle on your U joints too. So one of the ways to correct that a little bit is a longer lower control arm. That's going to correct the angle, push that back out to correct your pinion angles. And you're saying control arms, these are the mounts that mount the yep. axle to the frame of you'll, the vehicle. You'll hear them a lot. They're called four link. Yep. So what that is, there's two upper control arms and two lower control arms that actually hook that axle to the body. That's what allows it to flex and move as you're driving. And the longer your lower control arms are, the more um, 
aggressive your caster becomes on the yes. axle. And, and right. in, yeah. in reverse, <laughs> the shorter that the uppers are, the more, um, you know, the less caster it has. So basically, um, when you're setting up, say, a custom tube buggy or some sort of build, the uh, gold standard for your caster in degrees, I know off the top of the uh, inner seas on the axle, is somewhere between four and nine degrees. And that is pretty much where all of the factory built four wheel drive vehicles are. Yeah, I never got into it to that degree. <laughs> well, but here's yeah. he, that's important to know oh, yeah, because you can buy like an angle finder mm-hmm. and you, should fi- you find out. The, the best way to get a stock ride out of your lift kit vehicle is to check what the angle is on top of the inner seas of your axle in the mm-hmm. front, figure out what that angle is in stock form before you lift it, and then duplicate that with your lift kit. Yeah. You know, and so that's, uh, you know, that's very important to do that. And it gets you... You know, that kind of like stock ride. You know, a lot of people get that Jeep death wobble. Yeah. It's because the caster of the vehicle is set off. Yeah. You know, it's it's, it's just set it's wrong. It's crazy when you get into that how many different things can affect that, too. That That's the annoying thing. I've only experienced that twice in my life, and it scared me to death. <laughs> oh, really? Going about 60 miles an hour, hit a bump, and it just, whoa, buddy. Yeah. Not cool. Yeah, no, it's yeah. I, I've had it too as well, and it, yeah. you, you go down the road, and all of a sudden, starts shaking back and forth on you. Oh, well, you feel like you're gonna die. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that's the death wobble. Yes. Yeah. So um, let's say somebody has a vehicle that um, doesn't have coil springs, doesn't have leaf springs, at least one, at least one drive axle, mm-hmm. and. Um, Instead, they have independent front suspension or independent rear suspension. Mm-hmm. They want to lift it. What are their options? I mean, without getting to all the brands of lift kits out there, what are their options for lifting an independent suspension vehicle? So there's, I'm not terribly familiar with all the options available for that. There's some that um, it, it's a spacer that you bolt in. Some of them will have a replacement knuckle that is just it's longer on the top so it it gives you that increased height with the taller knuckle pushes that tire down yeah um and that's exactly right that they they offer different types of ifs and irs lift kits and typically if you're staying in that three inches or less range you can extend out um, the front coils or coil overs, yeah, whatever or ha- struts, struts, struts. Yep, yep. Wh- wh- that happens to be on there. You can extend that out. I've even seen strut spacers before. Well, that's what's on the fiance's tracker. Oh, okay. She has, I think, two inch strut spacers on the front, uh, front and rear of the tracker. Yeah, and it's simple. It gives it two inches of lift. Yeah, but like in that case. The CV shafts, so mm-hmm. the axle shafts that go from the differential housing out to the uh, wheel itself, are at a pretty severe angle. Yeah. <laughs> and if we lifted that vehicle another inch, mm-hmm. they would probably start binding or yeah. rubbing on the uh, arms. Yeah. So we, you know, we're kind of keeping it where it is right now. Mm-hmm. Um. But that's just uh, you know one of the disadvantages of doing that. Yeah. Um, now the more, exp- but they're cheaper. Yeah. Oh yeah. More expensive way to lift IFS or IRS is to buy a full kit that drops the center differential housing yes. lower. I've seen that they'll have a new K member on some of them on the really extreme ones, anyways. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. They and spacers. <laughs> yeah, and spacers, and a lot of them require permanent modifications to the truck that are yeah. not easily reversible, such as cutting off factory weld brackets, yeah. cutting off various things on the frame. So um, a suspension lift kit for an IFS vehicle is typically not very cheap to get a quality one. Yeah. And so that's something to consider. If you're thinking about buying a, a truck or an SUV and you're on a tight budget, but you still want to lift it or something, um, might want to look for something that's a little more archaic, yeah. something with solid axles, you know, something See, like that. See, that. that's something, too, like the, the Colorado I mentioned. Yeah. So 
if you tweak the stock arm, or not the, uh, I just forgot what they're called. <laughs> the uh, torsion bars? Yes, the torsion keys. You A lot of those, you can actually just tighten the torsion keys up. Yeah. You're putting those bars under a lot more strain that way, but you're going to get more of an appearance lift. The aftermarket keys actually give you that extra travel and a much more solid and beefy arm. Yeah, that's true. So if, if it's more cosmetic you're going for, you may have an option for your vehicle to do something like that. Or if you want to put a little bit of money in it, get a much better quality part, you know, that's the way to go. Exactly. So, you know, a lift kit on a vehicle is really not a good place to scrimp. No. Um, no, this is the direct suspension. This is what... Life and death. Yeah. I mean, your your axles, your drive train is hooked to the body. You use cheap parts on that. You may wish you hadn't done that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that's, that's something to think about, too. Uh, we currently do not have a sponsor for a lift kit company. Mm. We'd love to have one. Absolutely. There's, there's many of them out there. Oh, yeah. But... Um, Years ago, and this might be before your time, John, and I'm not going to name names, but there was an out west, there was a custom um, off-road shop that was building custom suspensions, uh, a lot of them for IFS vehicles, and then they mm-hmm. were also building uh, tube chassis for rock crawlers. Mm-hmm. Well, um, they were doing um, these real pretty um cosmetic welds Ooh. that had no penetration Ooh. they were doing the stack dime but the fake way by Ouch. just hitting it a piece at a time yeah and um you know they had people's suspensions that were literally falling apart on the trail because Ooh. all the welds were cracking yeah and i i'm i'm sure that company learned their lesson but i hope <laughs> yeah that's uh you know, look at the history of the company you're dealing with. Look yeah. at the quality of the product that they're offering. Yeah. And there's several that have been out there for a long time. Oh, yeah. So we talked about how lifting your solid axle, your IFS. Um, well, what other type of suspensions would you lift? Is that about it? There's, uh, what is it, the radius arm? Oh, yeah. good, good, yeah, point. That, good point. I don't know much about those and the... Can't remember what it's called now. Okay, I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. Radius arms uh, have two mounting points: one on the driver's side and the passenger side of the vehicle. Singular um, that go back towards the, almost the middle of the frame, maybe not that far back. And then typically they have coil springs that are holding, of course, the vehicle up. And then the you know between the axle and the vehicle. And that's a uh, that's how radius arm works. Very very simple setup, mm-hmm. and you know it's something that uh, has been around for a very long time. Yeah. Um, the only disadvantage to radius arms is they don't tend to offer the same amount of flex that say a four link or even a three link setup would yeah. be. And when you're talking about a four link or a three link in the suspension world and in the off road world, like a four link means that. Um, you have four points of contact that are going to the axle from the frame of the vehicle. So many different designs out there. Uh, you've got your, uh, like I said, there, there's custom three links, one links there. You could talk for hours on suspension design, but we're oh, kind of talking yeah. about the lift kits. Oh, yeah, just generic. I still can't remember what the other name is for the one. I'm trying to look it up, but can't the, find it. The generic or the other the name for the other what that you're trying to think of? Uh, isn't there? There's another type of suspension. I think it's on like the Broncos. It's like a, a split axle kind of thing. Oh, the twin traction beam. Yes, thank you. TTB. Yeah, the TTB front end. So yes, the, the driving me nuts. <laughs> yeah, uh, eighty to ninety six. The Ford Bronco had the TTB front end. Uh, so did the F one fifty, F two fifty. I know nothing about that other than it looks really complicated. <laughs> it's not that complicated. Essentially, what they did is they took a um, solid axle, split it in half, put put a U joint in the middle of it, huh. and it allows the entire assembly to flex. It, it's it's an okay setup, works all right off-road. It's not a great setup, but it works all right. Um, it actually has become a popular setup for some sand dune racers. Okay. Um, because they can make long travel suspensions with them. Oh, nice. Um, using some modern technology. Oh, yeah, of course. Coilovers and things like that. So, um, yeah, so those, those if you have a TTB truck, which is specifically going to be a Ford truck, 
in the uh, 80s, early 90s, that the easiest way to lift that is going to also be with um, lifted or re-arched springs or a um, blocks, you know, for the rear and then for the front. Um, there are there may be some kits available, but those are they're pretty obsolete trucks at this point. So I don't know if there's anybody else offering um, any sort of high tech. I'm not familiar with it. I just I know I've seen it and not a whole lot of information about stuff for them. Yeah, well, you know, there's just there's so many different types of um, suspension under vehicles. Uh, oh, you yeah. even have what's called. Uh, like in the back of the Durango, you have what's called a Watts linkage, which is... Uh, yeah, the PT Cruisers have those. Yeah, like it's a... Bell a compl- crank or something, rather. Yeah, it's a complicated yeah. suspension setup. Um, not real common in the off-road world. It would be interesting to see a lifted PT Cruiser on a trail, though. I've seen it. <laughs> really? Yeah, I think it was sitting on a blazer frame or something. Oh, well, that doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Um, speaking of things that are counting, um, we are counting down to our break time, so... Let's take a quick break, John, and then we'll be back in a second. Sounds good. It's cute when Rover shakes a paw for you. Good boy. And when he rolls over on command. That's it, buddy. But when he brings in fleas and ticks from the outside. Rover. Not so much. Rover can't help what time of year it is, but ABC Home and Commercial Services can. They're the best in pets, so give them a call and they'll come around and treat your yard. ABC Home and Commercial Services, 810-794-5678. Online at abcbees.com. All right, John, so um, the different types of lift kits that are out there, um, as we talk, we got blocks, we got coil spacers, uh, independent suspension lift kits where you take in, um, there's a, maybe a multitude of brackets. Uh, one of the disadvantages to IFS, uh, there's many for an off-road vehicle, but one of the disadvantages for lifting an IFS vehicle is many of the vehicles, um, or the lift kits available for modern IFS and even IRS vehicles require you to cut various tabs and brackets off the yep. frame. So it is a one and done thing. Yep. You modify it, it's not going to be taken back out and yeah. go back to stock. Um and you know, that's about as high tech as you get with the stock stuff. Now mm-hmm. beyond that, um and really they deserve their own mentions and episodes eventually in the future, but uh, you can get into custom crazy suspensions oh, that yeah. have nitrogen charged coilovers, mm-hmm. and um, those are all kits you can buy. Yeah, some of those crazy <clears throat> long arm kits and stuff. Yeah, that that we could probably most definitely do a whole episode on with that. Just the long arms and three link versus four link. I tend to agree with you. Yeah, I, I guess ending kind of our lift kit just little foray into what kind of lift kits are and what they mean um, would be a caution to young folks getting into the hobby. Mm. Um, For some reason, the belief has been amongst many of them that that's what you have to do to be cool in the four by four world is lift your vehicle. (laughs) Um, Ideally, if you're a hardcore wheeler, you want to keep the center of gravity as low as possible on your rig with the largest tire possible, which might mean cutting the tire or cutting the fenders to fit Mm -hmm. the tires. And um, doing that is, you know, you might only lift your vehicle a couple of inches. Um, in my opinion, and it doesn't mean it's right, but um, somebody that goes and spends, you know, $4,000 on a super custom lift kit for their Chevy truck because they've got IFS and it's very complicated, and then turns around and puts basically stocked size tires and wheels on it and drives it around looks pretty goofy sometimes yeah yeah it's more often than not yeah so there's you know you can make some pretty decent looking um custom vehicles but keep in mind that your lift kit needs to kind of match what your tire needs and wants are the, I, I suppose we should back up one quick step here. Okay. Probably the most important question to ask when you're looking to lift your vehicle, are you going to still drive this daily, or is this going to be an off-road only rig? That is a very important question. Why is it so important, John? Well, it opens up the amount of options. If you're going to still drive it on the road, you're not going to want to go as crazy. You know, if you're going off-road only... I know guys that have cut the inner fenders out. The tires come right up in the vehicle. 
Yeah. You know, it gives you a lot more options with what's there and what's available. I mean, you do that, you're not going to want to drive that on the road. <laughs> well, the, the, yeah, it's very true. You'd be probably getting gravel hit you know, oh, with, yeah. the, from the tires. Yeah. And, um, no, yeah, with the, you know, your, your different kits like you were talking about there and, um, you know, why you would want to take and, you know, Oh, I know what I was going to say. The the tire size needs to kind of match your lift kit. Oh, absolutely. But it compounds. Yes. So if you put a 12-inch lift kit on your truck just so you can fit, uh, say, a 38-inch tire, mm-hmm. okay, that might look great now, but now you have to look at your, you know, whether you need to re-gear your axles. Absolutely. Because of your different tire size. And at that point, then you got to start looking at aftermarket axle shafts. Yeah, it just <laughs> it's it's one thing after another. When the bigger you go, the you know the more trouble. I don't want to say trouble. The more things you're going to have to take into account. But That's again, you, very you put true. a little two to four inch lift on your stock Jeep, you run thirty threes with no issue. But if you're going to start doing rock crawling, you're going to have to look at like a six inch lift, big tires, you know, deep gears. It. I mean, it just it. You could go all day with this stuff. You really can. So, um, oh, yeah. and, and there's, but that's what you have to watch is that, you know, matches out, especially driving it on the street. Oh yeah. You're going to want to, your, your handling changes, your turning radius can change. You know, the higher you get, you're going to shift your center of gravity. So that really tight turn you made before, you know, if you turn just too tight, going too fast, you increase your potential for rollover in certain builds. Exactly. So, yeah, that's, uh. A very uh, a good point to make on that because you you want to make sure that the vehicle's still safe and then of course like we were saying earlier you don't put lift blocks in the front um, especially but um, keep in mind that the tires that you pick for the vehicle uh, when it's lifted you may not you know a lot of off road tires are not like a Z rated sport car tire yeah. so going around freeway off ramps and things like that. Um, free, freeway off ramps. <laughs> Did you just tell me on the air to move my head back to the mic? That's yeah. terrible, John. <laughs> oh man, dude, what are we doing? Um, a- anyways, uh, yeah, it's just you, you need to, um, uh, make, you sure, make sure, sure you're, you're taking everything into account, taking it all into account. Yeah. And for, for somebody new, this is, you know, a lot of stuff you may not know. That's yeah. where your forums, your Facebook pages are going to come in handy. You can look around and see what other people did. And that, that's, that's what I did when I started. I did all kinds of research on these kits. I looked at all kinds of build pictures people did, build threads, you know, of what, you know, similar things I wanted to do. And I just, you know, did the research and looked at the parts and figured out myself and, you know, talking with you, other people on some of the forums, what was best. And that's what I got. For now, you yeah, know, ask for around, absolutely, kind, kind of figure out what is going to be best for, yeah. you know, for you know your setup. Yeah, you, you know, if you've got a, a smaller rig that can do great on thirty ones or thirty twos, you, you you may only need a couple inches oh, left. Yeah. Um, I I know a guy. Uh, he had a so it's a Toyota. It's a built Toyota. He did the same engine swap that I did, and I believe he was running thirty fives on that truck. How much lift was he running on it? Uh, five inches, I want to say, maybe. I don't remember off the top of my head, but very capable vehicle. I mean, he's going to some of these off-road parks, doing some of the rock crawling trails, going up against these $30,000 rock buggies. I mean, he's tearing some of his suspension up. Just he didn't have the articulation, but he was able to do most of it. I mean, he kept very, very up with cool. these guys. These guys are dumping thirty grand into it. He dumped like four or five. That's awesome. Oh yeah, absolutely. That that you know that's and he still drove it daily. You don't have to put a ton of money into <laughs> no, these things. No, you can. There's another. So it's not really a kit. It's not really branded. Uh, the term you might hear junkyard lift. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. No, that's that's something that requires a tremendous amount of research sometimes. But again, you go to forums, you find what other people did. You know, I'll throw an example out there, like the the Grand Cherokee, uh, the ZJ Grand Cherokee. Yeah. You can take those coils, put them in the front of a, an XJ Cherokee, 
and uh, you'll get an inch of lift or two inches of lift out of that. And that's about the same with the TJs as well. So I think okay. you get a little less with the TJs. So Z, the heavier. ZJs offer. Yeah. So um, if, if you've got a local junkyard or, you know, a, a parts pull or you pull type place, you can do a budget lift using junkyard parts. Hey, you know, not to interrupt you there, but that actually kind of reminds me. Um, I had a trivia question of mine regarding the ZJ Cherokee. Okay. Sounds good. Um, what do you want to give them? Uh, well, well, we'll keep with our decal thing for now. Sounds good. Uh, how many decals? How about, how about we do um, a wheel and sticker and a thin line off road? I'm all out of the thin line off. It's a t shirt. Okay. I'll get, I'll, we'll do a wheel, wheel and decal. We'll, so we're going to only have one winner here wheel and decal and a thin line off road t shirt. Sounds good. Um, we will rant, pick from the correct answers if we have more than one on. Want to do four by four talk? Yeah, sounds good. All right. So if you haven't joined 4 by 4 Talk on Facebook, go ahead and do that. Uh, here's the question, and it is, it's another Jeep one. I know we had a Jeep question last week. We're going to do another one this week. Um, the ZJ uh, Grand Cherokee um, that uh, John was just talking about was available with a manual transmission mm. um, for a short time. Um, in fact, the... It is the only Grand Cherokee that was ever available to manual transmission. Um, but there was only, unlike most Jeeps where you could get 85 different manual transmissions <laughs> in it, there was only one model of manual transmission ever available in any Grand Cherokee oh, I line. Know this. <laughs> you know this one. I do. <laughs> so uh, you need to tell us what was the model of the manual transmission. Um, should we make it a little bit harder for them? We could. Okay, so what was the model of the manual transmission, and what engine did it come behind? There we go. Because it only came behind one engine. Yep. So one engine, and what transmission was it in the ZJ Grand Cherokee? We're giving you the year making model, or we're giving you the making model, not the year. Um, they didn't run them through all the way of the ZJ life, so and they're pretty rare. But uh, what could you get? And uh, go to 4 by 4 Talk. We're going to post up a trivia post there on the official trivia post. Uh, put your answers there. We're going to randomly draw. So Sounds good to me. Yeah, and this one, this one, I, I got to admit, would be pretty easily Googleable. Yeah, So, fairly. But um, we're just going to hopefully get yeah, some wing listeners. Wing it, see some, what happens. Yeah, we'll give them some <laughs> cool swag. See yeah. what's going on. So... Um, was I interrupting you on that or on the ZJ Cherokee on the junkyard lift? Or you kind of... No, you kinda... I, was, I was pretty much it. Just that the options... The options are there. If you don't have the budget, like I didn't really have much of a budget in the beginning, mm -hmm. and that's what I started looking at. I mean, you can build some very capable stuff using parts or sourcing parts like that. That's very true. Um, in fact, my first serious off-roader, you know, I, I told uh, on episode 15, I talked about um, how I used to wheel an IFS Jimmy, and then it became a solid axle Jimmy. And, you know, I talked about how I flipped the ball joints around, cranked the keys, which cost me nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I went to a solid axle, a little bit of research online, I found out that really by welding a couple of very simple brackets and tabs, I was able to use another set of S10 rear leaf springs in the front. Nice. To then bolt in a um, solid axle into my nice. Jimmy. And it was a pretty simple process. I've done a couple of them since in my shop. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, a neat way to go. And I did the same thing, researched and found some junkyard stuff. Yeah. Um, oh, hey, um, we did not mention who won the trivia episode for, or the trivia question for episode 15 yet. No, we, I don't think we did. No. no, we didn't. So we need to do that. Mm -hmm. um, we had one answer. So the question for episode 15 was, um, what was the year that you could get a manual transmission in a four-door S-truck. Remember mm. that? Yep, yep. And there was only one year, and um, Mr. Casey Cross, the one that actually inspired us in our mini-truck search oh. for the last couple of episodes we did before this, um, had correctly guessed 1991. Nice. In 1991, you could get a S-15 Jimmy or an S-10 Blazer, 
um, with a five-speed manual transmission awesome. behind the 4.3. And it was the NV3500. Um, not that you had to mention what it was. <laughs> um, it was a pretty rare combo. I have only seen pictures online of a four-door, four-wheel drive manual transmission. Um, in person, I have driven a two-wheel drive, four-door manual transmission. Nice. One, so... That was kind of a weird combination in my a mind, bit, I yeah. thought. But um, so good job there, Casey. We're going to send you down a uh, wheel and decal. So uh, congratulations there. And uh, well, John, is there anything that we're missing here? Do we do? Do we talk about news in the beginning? I think we did. Yeah. Uh, we went right to Project XJ. I don't think we covered any other topics. Oh, okay. Well, uh, you got any topics out there? No. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> Sorry. Huh? Uh, how about just mentioning wheels in the woods? Uh, September 28th, we've got Wheels in the Woods in Clay Township, Michigan coming out. That's going to be a big uh, uh, truck show there where you can come out. And uh, we've got all sorts of cool awards. I just got the proofs back um, from the printer for the, uh, the the prize plaques that we're going to have. And Sweet. I haven't even looked at them yet. I just got the email, and it popped up, and I haven't nice. opened the attachment yet. So looking Check forward to seeing out. what those look like. Absolutely. And so... Um, yeah, that'd be that'd be about it for news that I have. Yeah. If, and if anyone wants more information on that, they can go to themora.org or facebook.com slash the Mora Museum. And that'll have more information, links, uh, pictures from last year will be up there. Yeah, yeah. So, good job plugging yeah. that. I, I that's uh, it's important to us that the Mora succeed and Absolutely. Um, actually there you go. There's a little bit of news about the Mora. Oh. Um, I would like to give a huge shout out to uh, the Walmart Community Giving Foundation. Um, they uh, donated two hundred and fifty dollars to the Museum of Offered Adventure through a grant. Cool. So um, it's uh, going to help with some projects that we have at the museum. Absolutely, so much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. So um, we actually have been doing some um, tagging on social media because they do ask, uh, you know, do the hashtag Walmart Giving or uh, yeah, it's Walmart giving, and then there's another one. I forgot what it is. Or, or better, better Together. There's Walmart okay. giving and Better Together. And we've used both those hashtags through the Mora. Um, and it's very nice that they're supporting local community foundations Absolutely. like this. So it's very cool. Every little bit helps. Yeah. Um, well, John, I think it's about that time. Sounds good. Well, thanks for listening, and have a good one, everybody.